Hi everyone, nice to see you all again. My name is Rinku Gupta and again I'm from Argonne National Lab. In this short 15 minute session, let's briefly visit the topic of Agile methods. We spoke about this topic today morning, however we did not go into details and now is a good time to expand on it. In this short session, we will um, refine what an epic is and we'll go into more details. After that, we'll probably talk about process improvement in general. So in the morning, we discussed Agile. And when anybody is uh, adopting Agile, the concept of EPIC is important. And it serves to manage your Agile project. We saw in the morning that uh, EPICs are high-level requirements. In addition to EPICs, you also have stories and tasks. And uh, in terms of hierarchy, epics are top level, then come stories under epics, and then come tasks under stories. So epic stories and then tasks at the lowest level. An epic can have uh, multiple stories. Stories have to be marked as complete or have to be marked as done. When all stories are marked complete, that epic under which those stories are, that epic automatically completes. Stories can have tasks and tasks are basically just steps uh, so that you can uh, you know, finish the story. Some important things to remember is that, are that you, need to, uh, you need to break down and refine uh, the high level epics into stories only when you need to and as you need to. Ideally, you want to refine them closer to the time frame you know, when you're about to start working on that particular story. If you refine them too early on in the game, then you may have to change them later based on changing requirements. So you should uh, plan just enough so that you're ready to move forward, but don't plan so much that you end up reworking your plans all the, all the time. In terms of, so remember that in terms of timeline, higher level objectives like epics, they get defined earlier in the timeline and finer grained objectives like stories and tasks they get defined closer to the implementation timeline. When we talk about stories, one concept we didn't talk about at all uh, in the morning was uh, what is the definition of done? Defi defining the word done essentially tells everyone when that story is going to be completed. This done definition, uh, it should be understood by all stakeholders and it should be in you know, customer language. User language is important so that customers are able to understand what value they are getting from the story. Also defining done, it helps one understand the finer um, nuances of the high level uh, objectives of that particular epic. One more thing to mention about done is that it can also help align expectations among all the stakeholders. Now coming to the lowest level called tasks, when you start writing your story, eventually you will need tasks or steps to complete that story. These tasks may or may not be of interest. Usually they're not of too much interest to the customer as they're too low level, but they will be always needed by the development team. Let's explore a little more about the definition of done. One uh, simple way to think of a definition of done is a story which is done has met all the acceptance criteria for that story. Now, there are a lot of uh, definitions of what acceptance criteria means, and some of them are listed on the slide out here. For example, one definition from Microsoft, it says that uh, accept acceptance criteria are uh, conditions that a software product must satisfy to be accepted by the stakeholder and user or the end customer. Another definition by Google says uh, that acceptance criteria are pre-established standards or requirements a product or project must meet. Uh, now, uh, acceptance criteria can be of multiple types, usually three types. It could be functional, such as describing uh, the acceptance criteria can describe what functionality the product must exhibit. It can be non-functional, like uh, something related to uh, software quality or productivity or something like that or it can definitely be a uh, performance requirements that it should product must meet such and such performance. And this is very important in research uh, uh, environment and fairly common as well. 
Having a definition of done before you start a story can really be helpful. Let's say uh, you have some stories for your research project. Many times you don't know exactly what where some of your research efforts are going to go because many times you're working on future technology and everything is ambiguous. So you don't know where research efforts are going to go. You may not be able to predict as to what's going to happen, but it's still good to uh, define, uh, uh, you know, define an idea of what it would look like if that story were to complete. You know, In an agile environment, uh, you, uh, you may know the broad epic, but you may not have a full picture of all the stories that can compose that epic. However, it makes sense to have some stories defined so that you can prototype something efficiently. And you may not know where, what you are, where that epic is going to go. So you just write stories one at a time until a clearer uh, picture emerges. The definition of done should be defined by the people who are doing the work, uh, but it should be acceptable by the customer and it should be understandable by the customer. So we try to stick to com you know, common and simple language. Then criteria can be renegotiated uh, if they must be uh, with your customers when you need to. And one, the one thing to remember is that you don't need to specify a whole lot of details that are orthogonal in your done criteria. You don't have to specify implemented implementation details and say that I'm gonna have a, uh, a screen with a submit button here and the review button there unless there's a big dependency in the design. So do not get overly specific in your, uh, with your done criteria. Now refining our epic, let's revisit our epic uh, that we discussed uh, you know, in the morning, our earlier example. It's, I've listed it on the slide out here. The epic was for refactoring code for enhanced modularity. And if you don't remember, it was basically, uh, it, it was discussing a heat equation code and if you read the description, even in the, uh, on the slide, it covers two things. One is uh, the, the need for separating out utility functions. And the second is uh, separating out the integration function. So our Epic basically has two things. And if you remember, we outlined two stories uh, for this Epic for each of our objectives. And, uh, and uh, after writing these two stories, we, what, what we do is we start working on the definition of done, uh, and then we come up with a list of tasks from these stories. So on this slide, you can, you can see one example of done, uh, what done looks like for the first story, and you can see a task list for, uh, for the second story. So let's discuss this a bit. Uh, so my definition for done for the first story, uh, which focuses on separating ut utilities is, uh, all unit tests should have passed, integration system tests should pass, code review should take place, performance should be 95% of what it was before, and that the utility was demonstrated outside of just the heat equation. So what I've listed out here are, is all this is my interpretation of done for the story. And what you should do is if you are solving this story, then you would have your own interpretation. You should sit down with the team and figure out what, uh, what things to consider so that this story can be marked as done. Also, you have to ensure that the stakeholder or customer for whom the story is uh, created agrees to this done criteria. For the second story, we've shown some examples of what a task list should look like. So for example, you have task one, two, and three. The first task was adding testing for the integration function to ensure it works properly. Second was generalizing the interface. And third was, uh, exposing you know, uh, integration functionality through a new interface. You could totally add more tasks to the done criteria. You can make it personal as, you know, or applicable, as applicable as you want to your situation. When you break down epics into stories and tasks, there is no correct granularity. Do what is useful for your team and you'll figure out over time. And it may, it may vary a bit. You may have stories uh, sometimes that are very simplistic and you don't want to create new and separate tasks for them but rather you make a high level list under the story itself. So we're not looking really for unnecessary overhead here, but, uh, but sometimes you, know, you have like uh, two team members and task one is done by one and task two is done by another. So it, it's important to break them, break the uh, stories down into tasks sometimes so that everybody can, each person can take ownership of it. So let's talk about something that is pretty important in Agile. Let's talk about something called as agile estimation. 
your ability to estimate how long it will take to complete epics and stories is going to somewhat depend on your mature, on the maturity level of your process that you have adopted, as well as how experienced you are at uh, estimating. A significant point about agile estimating is that generally stories aren't estimated in hours. They are estimated using something called as story points. And story points are a relative estimate. So you ask, what is a story point? A story point is a number that tells a team about the difficulty level of the story. Now, the second question is, how do you decide what a story, what story point do I assign? Well, you sit with your team and you discuss the details. You get answers to the questions, talk about how to implement it. Basically, you know enough details about, about the first story and say, this is worth one story point. And maybe the next story seems more complicated. And you say, hey, this is worth four story points or five story points. So it's all pretty relative. And it's not really like uh, fixed hours or fixed uh, number of weeks and so on. And there are many estimating techniques that one can use. And sometimes people are really bad at estimating, but most people can somewhat consistently tell that this task is larger or smaller or about the same size as another task. You know, so that's easier. Uh, Scrum, for example, heavily uses, uses estimation and it allows a team to relatively accurately predict uh, when upcoming stories um, you know, might be completed. When it comes to estimation, try to keep things um, try to keep things simple. It's a lot easier to estimate <clears throat> if you break down a large epic into smaller stories and, and smaller tasks, in my opinion. It's easy to miss stuff if you don't break down. And it's quite possible to underestimate the cost of adding tests or, or, uh, or running, running uh, you know, tests, adding tests or even running them. The good quote uh, that one should remember on this slide. Let's talk a bit about process improvement. So, you know, when you're talking about, hey, I want to improve X, such and such a process, we are essentially saying that uh, uh, add more processes to improve X, X, Y, Z. Realistically, when you want to improve something, there's a cost to adding any process. So there's always going to be some overhead associated with getting started. And one hopes that there is a big payoff after the initial higher cost. One hopes that the ongoing cost will be less and will benefit the team over time. So we are hoping that you don't get overwhelmed by this bit of overhead that you see in, uh, uh, in the slide out here. The slide shows um, uh, a graph and it shows how there's a green straight line going up ahead, which is the startup cost. And eventually the payoff ensures that the new process is, uh, co will cost lesser than the old process. Let's now talk a bit about uh, how do you uh, how do you implement how do you implement uh, improvements in your project? And one way to implement improvements in your project is a very nice process called PSIP. PSIP stands for Productivity and Sustainability Improvement Planning. It's an extremely lightweight process for you to adopt better practices in your project in small incremental ways. You can get more information about what the details of the PSIP process using the, some of the URLs mentioned at the bottom of the slide. On this slide, uh, we show two examples of the PSIP process and su two successes with the PSIP process that two projects have had. One example is uh, the MPitch project's PSIP for onboarding new team members. And the other is the Exalt project's PSIP for uh, continuous integration testing. For example, with MPitch onboarding PSIP, you start with whatever is your initial score. In this case, there was no onboarding process. And then there were a series of steps that you worked your way through and you track those steps to track that particular improvement. That's how, that, that is how PSIP works. I would encourage anyone who's interested in uh, improving processes on their team to check out uh, the, the PSIP process. There are a lot of examples on the PSIP website that will be useful for you. And, um, 
and uh, can definitely help you improve your team's functioning in small and incremental ways. With this speed talk, I, I, I'll, uh, I'll end this session and I have a couple of minutes uh, for, um, for any questions that you may have.